invite the rest of the congregation to stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel today can be found on page 841 of your pew Bibles. Apostle, our gospel according to Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 26. When they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee, as Jesus stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wild. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Two families, one hog, 11 deaths, 125 years of family feuding. I am talking about the Hatfields and the McCoys. It is suggested that these two families began their infamous feuding during the time of the American Civil War. Legend has it that the feud began when a McCoy of Kentucky accused one of the West Virginian Hatfields of stealing a hog. Feelings over this allegation festered, resulting in the shooting death of one of the Hatfields. While well, retaliation led to more retaliation until the feud claimed 11 more family members over the next 10 years. Subsequent conflicts involved court battles over timber rights and even cemetery plots. Ever since, this feud has been a part of American folklore, and it serves as an example of what the cycle of fear, anger, retaliation, demonization can look like, and how this cycle can continue seemingly with no end. Now, I'd like to believe that the Hatfields and the McCoys are an exaggerated case, but they're not, because this tit-for-tat kind of thinking is lived out all over the place even in seemingly innocent places like a preschool, you'll see it. 
It usually happens when two or more youngsters get caught up in a squabble, and when the teacher comes to intervene, one of them shouts out, well, he started it. You know, even as children, we have a system of justice ingrained in us. When we feel like we've been a victim of some injustice, we can be quick to implement our own system of justice. We react, and before we know it, we are caught up in a nasty cycle of reaction and action. And where does it end? How many hurtful comments, how many lawsuits, how many gunshots, or even how many bombs get dropped before it ends? It's a vicious cycle that divides friends and families, communities, and entire countries. The cycle becomes a prison, and it holds all participants captive. We feel wrong, we feel hurt, we feel fearful, so we demonize the other. We reach for more ammunition, we seek out vengeance. Or maybe we just decide to build bigger walls to keep out those that we have decided should be on the other side. <clears throat> what is missing in this approach? I think freedom. This cycle leaves little room for forgiveness or grace or joy or life. This vicious cycle of tit for tat cannot bring peace, it cannot bring healing or restoration. And it is healing, peace, and restoration that we so desperately need. This week we are hurting following the mass shooting in Orlando. But are we surprised by it? I don't think so. Exactly one year ago to the day, we were trying to make sense of the horrific shootings in Charleston. And before that, names like Sandy Hook, Newtown, Virginia Tech, Fort Hood, Columbine, the Boston Marathon ring out in our heads. There has to be a better way to live together. And there is. The Gospel story today and the Apostle Paul show us a more loving way to live together, a more loving way to treat one another. In our Gospel story, Jesus leaves the comfortable, predominantly Jewish area of Galilee and crosses the sea to the land of the Gerasenes. Now this, this is Gentile territory, not a place a Jewish rabbi would normally venture off to. And once on land, he is encountered by a man possessed by unclean spirits. And Jesus drives these unclean spirits out of him. But the real healing comes when Jesus tells him to return to his home. You see, freedom for this man means not only being rid of what demonizes him, it means being restored back to his community. When the man was bound by demons, he existed in isolation. After he encounters Jesus, he is commissioned to service among his people. Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And that is exactly what he does. This is the healing that we so desperately need today. The kind of healing that restores community the kind of healing that restores freedom, freedom that breaks the chains that keep us divided, freedom that reminds us that there is no us or them. There is no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male or female, no black or white, no rich or poor, no Christian 
or Muslim, no gay or straight, we are all one. No one is left out of God's love. And if you were to ask our Gospel writer Luke and the Apostle Paul why, they will point to the cross and they will say, because he started it. Jesus started a better way, a more loving way to live together and to treat one another, a way that heals rather than hurts, a way that builds up rather than tears down. Now this is a better way to live. This is a better way to heal, to be united. And it doesn't mean that we must all agree. Christ has not done away with our differences. Rather, Christ has overcome the power of our differences to divide us. The church is united not by the fact that we are all the same, but because Christ Jesus has made us all children of God. So what can this better way of living look like, and how is it even possible when our world is hurting, when our world is so broken? Over the last two months, a group of us have been reading through a story that took place during the Civil War in Liberia. It was in the 1990s, and the Civil War had been raging in Liberia. Rebel warlords were fighting to overthrow Charles Taylor, the corrupt dictator. And as the fighting increased, the levels of violence spread. The people in the country were terrorized from both sides of the conflict. Violence, death, and destruction were everywhere. Yet during this time, a small band of women carried by their faith and moral courage, came together to hold on to what they knew to be good. They started a peace movement, a movement that forced the government and the rebels to sign peace resolutions, and a movement that forced the corrupt dictator out of power. When the war ended, the women made sure that the resolutions were implemented, they worked to ensure the full disarmament of the country. And more than this, these women began to work to forgive their perpetrators and convince each one of their perpetrators that they would be accepted back into the community. This was the real work of healing. This was the real work of building peace in their country. Viva Flomo is one of the peacemakers. In her work, she continues to focus on healing in her country. She's working on mending broken relationships between the survivors and the offenders of the Civil War. In an interview, she spoke candidly of the difficulty in forgiving and accepting back into the community those that had caused so much pain. She explained that the forgiveness process is painful and long. But she says, in the healing process, it is important that you forgive. If you forgive, this is like cutting the chain off. If I have wronged you, we are tied together until we can settle that particular thing. Now, she didn't excuse the actions of the perpetrators but recognized if there was going to be peace in the country, they had to be a part of the healing and the reconciliation process. They had to be a part of building back what had been torn down. And she stepped up to lead people in healing. And as she did this, she knew that she could not react out of her feelings of hurt, sadness, or anger. She had to see the humanity in the returning soldiers, see how they too were victims of the Civil War. Can you imagine, she said, this is the boy that was nine years old when he joined the fighting force. He was in the third grade when it started. He's now 23 years old and still in the third grade. It took three or four days to disarm him, demobilize him, but to reintegrate him it takes more than three days. 
This is the trouble. And we have told them we have to go through the complete cycle of trauma healing so we can have these boys back in our community. When I hear Viba's words, I think, wow, she is strong. And she is strong, but her strength is grounded in something bigger than herself. It is grounded in her faith. And her faith frees her to see the good, to see the humanity in all people, and to relate to others with generosity of spirit and genuine compassion. Now, you and I may not stop an entire country in the midst of civil war, but we are peacemakers. Each and every day, there are ways that we can work peace and healing into the relationships around us. And like Viba, our strength is grounded in something bigger than ourselves. It is grounded in Christ, and we can say with conviction, well, he started it. Because Christ did start the cycle of love and grace. And it is this love and grace that brings us together. Christ's love for us is not a reaction to how well we deal with God or in any way merited by our situations. Jesus is not reacting to our goodness or our impressive good deeds. Nor is Jesus motivated by seeing that we get what we really deserve. He's not dependent on our actions to know how to feel and act toward us. Jesus acts out of the freedom that is grounded in who he is. Jesus is love. When we hear the words at our baptism, you are a child of God, we are given this identity. We belong to Jesus and we belong to each other. Freedom is discovered in community where there is no distinctions and where we are bound together in love. Grounded in Christ's overflowing grace, we are freed to respond to others with this love. We are freed to seek responses to one another that break the cycles of evil and create new ways to move towards one another in a peaceful and loving way. This is a far more excellent way to live. Amen.